Hi everybody, welcome to the chapter 29 video, Aggregate Demand and Aggregate Supply. This is a very important chapter, so please follow along, pause whenever you need to, and, uh, and then go back, use, use your book, use your notes, use your groups. So we're actually not going to do this this year because I'm in, uh, in California, so um, we'll skip through these two. But do pay attention to these particular topics. So every year there's a, there's a pretty good history of a question or two coming straight out of these particular topics. There's a nice long paragraph or two about each and pay attention to it. Okay, so aggregate demand is basically all of the demand added together. So the demand of businesses, right? So um, you got IG plus C plus G plus XN, that's GDP. And GDP and aggregate demand have a lot of parallels to them. So there's an inverse relationship. And you know already what the re real balances affect the interest rate effect and the foreign purchases effect because you did the, the reading on those like I referred to you from the previous thing. So do pay attention to those, but we're not going to go into them specifically on this video. So aggregate demand is downward sloping. So notice that it's aggregate, right? So that, that A is a, a big important thing. And then notice that we've got real GDP on the bottom and price level here on the vertical axis. So as the price level falls, aggregate demand will increase. That's the change in price that gives us movement along an existing aggregate demand curve, which is different from a shift of aggregate demand, which would be like the whole curve moving to the right or to the left. We'll get to that later on. So our determ or if, if we're going to move aggregate demand, then we're going to deal with the determinants. Okay, so in the previous slide, you saw change in price level, which gives you movement along the existing aggregate demand, right? So that looks something like this, movement from here to here because of a change in price level from there to there. This, now we're talking about a shift in aggregate demand from AD to AD1, okay? So that whole shift. There are two uh, components involved. So one is the change in the determinants, and then the other is the multiplier effect. We'll do this, um, or sorry, we covered that last chapter. All right, so got the multiplier effect, which is what this dotted line is. So this is the initial change in spending. But then after it goes through the multiplier, that initial change in spending then gives us a larger total change in aggregate demand. And this, of course, is the basis for the idea behind government, event, government intervention in Keynesian economics. It can obviously go the other way, too. You can have a shrinking, right? So that initial change in spending to the negative, to the lower spending, gives us this smaller total amount of aggregate demand from all those same multiplier reasons that we discussed last chapter. Okay, so consumer spending is determined by these four things. Consumer wealth, the level of borrowing, our expectations, and taxes. So these things can all go up or down, and that will change what we, that will change where we wind up uh, moving our aggregate demand curve. Investment spending, on the other hand, is more about real interest rates. So this is the, these are the changes that make businesses make their decisions. So as interest, oops. As interest rates change, then we get more spending if they go down, less investment spending if they go up. Expected returns. So likewise, they will invest more if they think that their returns are going to go up. So what makes a business think that its returns will go up in the future? Well, expectations about future business conditions. Better technology, uh, the degree of excess capacity. So basically, if they have to build more capacity, in order to accommodate the additional excess, uh, the additional investment spending, then you know they wouldn't do that. So, but if there's excess capacity, if there's just stuff laying around that they could very easily pull online in order to make uh, in order to make more stuff, then they would. 
and business taxes. So if we believe that taxes are going to go down in the future, then uh, investment will rise. Government, on the other hand, um, so when government spending increases, aggregate demand increases, as long as interest rates and tax rates don't change. So there is a bit of a, a deal where it's what's called the crowding out effect. We'll get to it later. But you can imagine a circumstance where the government spends so much money that either interest rates rise, which is one possibility, right? Either interest rates could rise, and we'll get into the specific relationship between government and interest rates. Um, that's the crowding out effect that I referred to. But then there's also tax rates. So let's say at the state level, typically states are not allowed to run a deficit. So if the, the government, the, the state government in Missouri decides that it's going to spend a bunch of extra money, well, it's got to pay for that. And one of the ways that they can typically pay is by raising taxes. So if either of those things change, they could counterbalance or counteract government spending changes. Okay, so typically when we talk about government spending, we're talking about transportation projects. So we're going to build more roads, build more bridges, that kind of thing. Um, and then obviously government spending sometimes decreases, and this will decrease aggregate demand. And that would be an example of that would be like decreasing military spending. But obviously you can also say, you know, the government will not build schools, will not build airports, will not build roads, some of the public goods that they often choose to provide. So net export spending depends. This is a little bit more complicated because it's not just about what's going on in the states, but also national income. So you can imagine a circumstance where national income in the United States is doing very well, uh, but national income abroad is really not doing very well. So exports would go down because nobody has enough money to buy our stuff. Then there's also exchange rates. And we're not going to go into this in detail now. Just remember that the dollar can appreciate or depreciate. And it doesn't necessarily have all that much to do um, with what's going on domestically. It's certainly connected, but it is not nearly as connected as a lot of the connections that we've been discussing so far. So we've so far in this chapter discussed aggregate demand, but there's also aggregate supply. And we've talked a little bit about this already. It has a lot of parallels to supply in the product market like we discussed last semester. So this is total real output produced at each price level. So at different price levels, businesses are going to be interested in supplying differing amounts of goods and services. The relationship is going to depend on the time horizon. So there's the immediate short run, the short run, and the long run. Now in the immediate short run, our supply curve is perfectly horizontal because we believe, for the most part, that prices are pretty darn sticky in the short run. Not completely sticky, but pretty sticky. So price doesn't change in the immediate short run. Um, so we just manage inventory. So price remains constant. We either sell out of our inventory or we build up our inventory. In the short run, so not the immediate short run, just the regular short run, prices can flex, but they typically will flex up a little bit more than they flex down. Um, but what you see here is when prices rise, there is a, a portion of this, um, and I'll have to, to draw this in. So now, so you are imagining two different demand curves, okay? So a demand curve here and a demand curve here. So different demand curves, and what you see is in both circumstances, Q increases, and in both in circumstances, price level increases. So you got to ask yourself, we are making more stuff as aggregate demand goes from AD to AD1. We're making more stuff, and more stuff is good, but we're paying a lot more as well. So a lot of the extra money being spent is actually being absorbed through increases in the price level rather than just increases in output. Now, here, in the long run, we see that the aggregate supply curve is vertical at the quantity of full employment. So at the full employment quantity of production, that's where our long run aggregate supply curve is going to be. In the short run, we can produce a little bit above full or a little bit below full. Right, so we're but we're going to be hitting if we're way out here, okay, in the short run, then we're going to be kind of at demand pull inflation because everybody's going to have so much money. If we're over here, then we're going to be kind of toward recession. Okay, so in the long run, 
Aggregates, the long run aggregate supply curve definitionally will always be vertical at the full employment quantity of production. That's an important point. Please remember that. So what are the determinants of aggregate supply? What are these shift factors? Those are the things that are going to collectively position the aggregate supply curve and changes raise or lower per unit cost. So we have the same multiplier effect, and it goes in both directions, just like you would expect. So here we have an initial change in aggregate supply, which leads to this larger change in aggregate supply. Now our import input prices are, uh, are going to be domestic resource prices, so how, the, the price of labor, the price of capital, the price of land. And then the prices of imported resources, so we, we import a lot of oil, but then other imported things. We import steel, we import a little bit of food, not a ton. Coffee is the, the main food that we import. Um, but then we've also got exchange rates. So, you know, everything requires oil. And anything that we buy is going to have these exchange rates. So the strength of a dollar relative to the strength of the currency of the country that we're buying stuff from is going to affect input prices. Additionally, not only input prices affect supply, but also our level of productivity. So we've already talked about productivity, and we know that increases in productivity reduce cost. So if I can become a more productive econ teacher, and I can teach four sections or five sections or six sections, right, that many more students, then my total output over my total, so I'm still one, and instead of, you know, three classes over one, so my productivity would be three, if I can all of a sudden teach five sections and I'm five over one, my productivity is five, and now, you know, St. Louis U High has a better, uh, more productive economics department. So the per unit cost of production is just your total input over your total output, okay? So the legal institutional environment is another thing that impacts supply. So basically taxes and subsidies. So if taxes go down, then supply is going to go up. If taxes go up, supply will go down. And the extent of government regulation. So you're hearing a lot about this in our current political environment. If we decrease regulation, then businesses will be able to be more effective they'll be able to supply more stuff. And that's pretty darn true. Um, now, of course, sometimes taking away the regulation leads to other problems, and sometimes those problems are things we don't anticipate problematically. But oftentimes, deregulation works out well. So, like you've come to expect in supply and demand, there's going to be an equilibrium. So, if we are at this price level, then aggregate supply will be down here, aggregate demand will be up there, and there will be some shortage. So what's going to happen then is the price level is going to rise, Q will go down a little bit, and then we'll wind up right here. Okay, So this is output demanded, output supplied, and these are various price levels. And remember that the price level is always going to be an index. So this is not $92 and $100, it is $100 the base year, $92, you know, which would be losing value or deflating, and then we would have up here, you know, 110, which would be an inflated value, okay? So when we have demand pull inflation, so demand pull infl inflation, remember, happens when demanders with too much money pull up prices. Sometimes uh, we can sort of hope or pretend like price would remain constant, and then we would have this Q2. But typically, demand pull inflation, because it's inflation and we're in the short run, so we have this diagonally upsloping aggregate supply curve, we see that we go from this price level up to this price level. So we only go to Q1 rather than Q2. Okay, So we started off at QF, but then we're at full employment, so everybody who wants a job has a job, minus the, you know, so we're at the natural rate. Oops. So we're at the natural rate of unemployment. Um, then all that money gets pumped into the economy and some of it is absorbed by making more stuff and some of it is absorbed by charging higher prices. We unfortunately don't exist in this Q2 reality where prices remain constant because then of course we would have a shortage. So in a recession, aggregate demand falls. And in a recession, especially if we assume that prices are sticky, then it's actually worse because we wind up with Q1 rather than Q2. 
if, if prices can flex downward, then production will only fall to Q2. But if prices are sticky, then they'll fall all the way down to Q1. So we believe typically during recessions that prices are generally downwardly inflexible. And the re so that's the sticky downward. Uh, the fear of price wars is part of the reason, what we call menu costs. So that's when you change prices, you have to actually like go through and change all of the, the prices. So just imagine a restaurant has to reprint all of its menus. Well, it doesn't really want to do that because there's a cost involved. That's a really simple example. There's also wage contracts. So, you know, once you have a, a contract that, state, that says you're going to get paid a certain amount, then the business is on the hook for paying those people that specific amount. So it becomes difficult to... Um, uh, to, to pay them less because they're contractually obligated to pay a certain level. There's this concept of efficiency wage, which states that when you lower people's wages, they get angry and do a less good job. So their productivity falls, they become less efficient. So you might pay them less, but if they accomplish less, then you didn't actually wind up saving anything because of the relationship between time worked and productivity. And then finally, you have the minimum wage law. So sometimes you're not allowed to pay less just because of the minimum wage. Now, when we have a situation of cost push inflation, and you've seen this already, I already drew this on the board for you earlier, um, but in this example, cost of production is going up because of something. Okay, so there's some sort of supply shock that pushes aggregate supply to the left. And in this situation, we go from price level P1 to price level P2, and our quantity falls from QF down to Q1. So how is this going to get resolved? Well, the way typically, oh, I'm sorry, we skipped on to a different thing. So now we're looking at increases in, we'll get back to the to solving that recession later on, I apologize. Um, but what we're looking at here is increases in aggregate supply up to the level of full employment. So we started off at aggregate supply one, and then aggregate supply increases, and aggregate demand increases. Okay, so we'd be up at P3 and B if we didn't have an, a commensurate increase in aggregate demand. So this is a simultaneous shift. We didn't do this very much last semester. But what you're seeing basically is aggregate supply goes up, employment goes up. Since employment goes up, aggregate demand goes up. These things happen together, and we wind up at C rather than B. B is where we would be if there was no shift in aggregate supply. It was only a shift in aggregate demand. So you can kind of read through this. There's some really interesting stuff about the 70s and the 2000s and why those things changed, but they're not, I'm not going to go through them in the video. And that is going to wrap us up for Chapter 